and what you need to know about Film Successor. Um, just we're going to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Um, and so just to let you know, this is going to be approximately 30 to 45 minutes. We are going to allow for a question and answer session towards the end. Please put all questions and answers or all questions in the chat window. The webinar will be recorded and it will be emailed to you in the next couple of days. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us and I would like to introduce you to today's presenters. Um, our primary presenter is Steve Angel. He's a solution architect based out of out of Alpharetta, Georgia. We also have Phil Bartholomew. He's our founder and director, and he's an identity and access management expert. And we also have Peter McKenzie. He's our director of sales and based out of Toronto. And Steve, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Kristen. Good morning, everyone. As Kristen stated, uh, my name is Steve Angel. I am a solution architect uh, with New Signature. My specific focus area is on identity and access management. I am joined today by Phil Bartholomew. Phil is a director with New Signature and is also a subject matter expert in identity and access management, and specifically with regards to the Microsoft Identity Management Platform. Phil will be monitoring and fielding questions submitted in the chat with us today. And additionally, we should have five to ten minutes at the end of the presentation to try to answer any additional questions you may have. So let's jump right in and we'll get started. Now I noticed uh, through the poll that um, a lot of folks are on the call that are not familiar with um, Microsoft Identity Manager, so I want to take just a few minutes to point out that the core of the product has been around for over 15 years. The product originally began as Zoomit, which Microsoft acquired in 1999, and has gone through several iterations since then, as you can see here. After purchasing Zoomit, Microsoft relaunched the product as Microsoft Meta, De Meta Directory Services, or MMS. In 2003, Microsoft Identity Integration Server, or MIS, was released as the first Microsoft standalone identity management platform. And the next release would come in 2007 as Identity Lifecycle Manager 2007, or ILM. And in early 2010, Forefront Identity Manager, or FIM, was released. After a major update in 2012 to bring us to FIM R2, the latest release came late last year in the form of Microsoft Identity Manager 2016, or MIM. MIM is a robust and full-featured identity management platform that integrates with virtually any cloud or on-premise identity directory. So for those of you familiar with or perhaps using FIM today, the first thing we should discuss is what has not changed. Basically, this. The Sync Engine, which is the true heart of the Microsoft Identity plat Management Platform, has really not changed. The Sync Engine interface still pretty much looks the same, and all the familiar components are there, such as management agents, run profiles, and et cetera. Likewise, the portal has, at least at an initial glance, remained unchanged as well. However, there are some new capabilities that have been incorporated into the portal, and we'll discuss those in a bit more detail coming up. So what's new? Well, there are several great additions as well as some enhancements to some existing features we already had in Forefront Identity Manager. And we're going to cover each of these in a bit more detail as we move along. However, let's touch on these just briefly here. We have new capabilities around privileged access management. There have been some enhancements to hybrid identity capabilities, specifically around reporting. 
With the self-service capabilities, there is now also an account unlock feature that has been added uh, along with multi-factor authentication capabilities for self-service password requests. And finally, there have been some enhancements to the certificate management component of the identity management platform. These have been completely revamped for ease of use as well as functionality. So we're going to get started talking about privileged access management. Now for most organizations, elevated access is typically handled using security groups. Groups such as domain admins, server admins, or even user-defined groups are used for elevated access when changes are needed throughout the environment. Now, if you're following best practices, then those with administrative privileges typically will have two accounts. They'll have one for day-to-day -day activities and then another that they'll use when they need to perform uh, administrative functions. This best practice does help in that the user should only be entering their administrative credentials when they need to perform administrative level functions. And this also prevents some accidental damage since the user has to perform an extra step to make changes in the environment. When they're logged in with their daily account, they shouldn't have the access rights needed to make critical changes. But there are two problems here. First, it's harder to track and monitor changes in the environment if administrators have elevated access levels 24-7. These elevated levels provide a means of making changes, sometimes significant ones, and many times the, these changes are not approved or may not be authorized. How many times has something changed in your environment without your having knowledge of who made the change or, or maybe what the change even was? We hear about them all the time. It can be changes as simple as a change to an organizational unit or possibly changes to security groups or perhaps there's changes made to critical folders on a file server and they've been removed, renamed, or possibly even deleted. Secondly, when users have elevated permissions 24-7, the impact of a compromised account could be disastrous. If an attacker or an even a disgruntled employee manages to obtain an administrative level account, the result could be loss of sensitive data, extended downtime, and even loss of revenue. This is where privileged access management, or PAM for short, steps in by addressing always on administrative rights. MIM, with its PAM capabilities, utilize the approach of just in-time access, just enough time access, and just enough administration for controlling access um, when critical functions are being performed. With MIM, before a user can perform an administrative task, they have to request access. If approved, they are granted the access just in time, meaning the access is turned on at or about the time requested. This access is only granted for a specific window of time to perform the required task. The access levels are predefined so that the user has just enough administrative rights to, re to perform the required functions. If we look at the MIM portal, everything pretty much looks the same as it did in FIM. However, near the bottom left, we can see in addition for privileged access management, as well as two sub functions for PAM roles and PAM requests. The PAM request links is where requests for elevated access have been requested and also will show the status of those requests. Additionally, a portal administrator can create new requests from this view. The PAM roles link is where MIM administrators would create the roles for privileged access. And I'd like to go into a few of those options with you today to show you what are available to provide the necessary controls around privileged access. So when you create a new PAM role, the first thing you'll do is give the role a name. Here we have the example of domain administration. But some other roles that might come to mind are password resets or perhaps account management, maybe even scheme administration would be a defined role. <clears throat> the, 
The idea is that these roles should be predefined and provide the requester with a specific and limited set of permissions for a specific amount of time. Beneath the name we see we have PAM privileges. This is tied to security groups that are managed by FEM that have the permissions or the delegated rights necessary to perform the task associated with this role. You'll also see time to live for the PAM role. This is the setting that allows for the duration of the privileged access request. So if a user uh, or a specific role should be able to be performed in five minutes or less, you can set 300 seconds as it is here. And once that time has elapsed, the access is automatically. You'll also notice that we have the ability to incorporate multi-factor authentication or MFA to this request. For super user level access requests, this provides yet another level of security by requiring a second factor authentication by the requester to prove their identity prior to the request going through the approval process. You'll also see that there's an approval required box that specifies whether or not the request may be, must be approved prior to being granted. Not all access requests must have um, an approver. If there's certain levels of access, such as, you know, we'll think about the password reset, this is where you could, um, you could grant the access, the user could request, and access could be granted automatically. But if your elevated permissions require you to make more significant change, you may want to select approval required. And that way it must go through an approval process where someone has to actually look at and validate the request prior to granting the access request. We'll move on to the Candidates tab, and here you'll see that you can also add users that should be authorized to submit a request for this level of access. This adds yet again another layer of control by preventing users who should never have the access levels associated with this role from ever requesting the access in the first place. So to quickly recap privileged access management, workflows can be created for users to request administrative level access to perform various duties. Additionally, it is easy to configure an approval process for specific access requests. This way, an approver can review and weigh the validity of the request prior to granting the request for elevated access. An added benefit for leveraging MIM for privileged access management is that MIM provides an audit trail of whom requested access and when, so you've got accountability as well. This will greatly reduce the risk associated with administra administrative level access by controlling the time in which the elevated rights are available, and it also greatly reduces the likelihood of accidental system change. One more note here is that PAM also provides protection against known attacks such as pass the hash, pass the ticket, and spear phishing attacks as well. So keep that in mind when thinking about uh, privileged access management and the capabilities of MIM. So we'll shift gears a little bit and we'll start talking about hybrid identity and the enhancement that MIM has made in that space. So first of all, a little background. Uh, according to PasswordResearch.com, the average person today has a total of eight and a half passwords that they have to remember for access to various corporate resources. And these are corporate resources alone. Many times users have to remember a password to log on to their workstations. And then they may have another one for email. They may have others for internal applications and still other passwords to access cloud-based applications. This typically results in poor password habits such as weak passwords or even the user writing passwords down and storing them in a drawer or under the keyboard. The concept of a hybrid identity began during the days of film. It incorporates several different services to reach the utopian vision of one identity and one password. Azure Active Directory Premium, Azure AD Connect, Azure Application Proxy, and Microsoft Identity Manager all combined to allow for each user to have a single identity that can be used to access all resources, whether on-premise or in the cloud. The new capabilities of MIM 
Add to this by providing administrators the ability to configure reporting on specific activities that are integrated into Azure Active Directory Premium for reporting purposes. This data is available for 30 days via the Azure portal and focuses on three specific areas. And we'll look at each of these in a bit more detail. The first of these reports is for password reset registration. This report would allow administrators to see which users have completed the SSPR registration process and what forms of verification they chose during the registration process. You'll note that the same report format is available for users using Azure SSPR or for Identity Manager or MIM. This is available from a single report and will also help in the transition from uh, on-premise self-service password reset or possibly even using Azure for self-service password reset. So depending on the platform and the options allowed in this in the configuration, the types of reset verifications will vary. These can be security questions, uh, SMS text to the user's mobile device, or even an authentication phone call. The next report we have available is for password reset activity. Again, this report can include data for either Azure SSPR or Microsoft Identity Management SSPR. The report provides details on users that have used the SSPR capabilities, the date and time the process was attempted, the methods used for password reset, as well as the result of attempt to reset their passwords. This information is helpful for tracking user activity, identifying users that may be having issues when performing self-service password resets, and also for identifying potential attempts to compromise a user, user's account by leveraging the self-service password reset capabilities. Again, all of these reports are available for a 30-day period, and as you can see, you can select um, the dates from the boxes above as long as it is within that 30-day period. The third and final report is around self-service group activity. Here you can monitor any changes to group membership performed using the MIM portal or additionally report uh, changes made through groups through Azure Active Directory Premium. As with all the reports, you can choose the date range, like I said before, uh, as long as it's within the last 30 days. And by selecting the source, you can choose between the identity management platform or Azure AD Premium itself. So when thinking about hybrid identity, uh, just one thing to point out here, that, I mean, the ultimate goal is happy users. The second goal would be a more secure approach to accessing applications, which in most cases will also add the added benefit of user productivity because the users are not having to remember multiple passwords, multiple user IDs to access the corporate resources they need to perform their job. So we've mentioned a couple of times um, self-service capabilities available within uh, MIM and formerly within FIM. So now we're going to take a few moments just to dive in and talk about the new capabilities enhancements to self-service that are, that are available in the MIM portal. So for any of you out there today that may be using FIM, uh, you're probably already taking advantage of self-service password reset or SSPR using the FIM portal. The SSPR function itself has not really changed in MIM. However, MIM adds the ability now for users to also unlock their password. This can come in very handy in today's mobile world. Um, and to give you an example, let's think about a user that has changed their password just before going on uh, extended leave, such as a vacation. When they return, they cannot remember what they set their password to before they left. So they use the reset portal and they go in and create a new password. However, their mobile device is still using the old password that was stored prior to leaving for vacation. So later in the day, what happens? They find their account has been locked out. Well, now with the account unlock capabilities, they have the ability after updating their mobile device with a new password 
they can unlock their account using a familiar interface. So instead of having to contact the help desk to unlock their account after performing a password reset, users can now proactively handle locked accounts using the MEM portal. Now, as I said previously, the password reset feature really hasn't changed. And for the most part, this is true, but there has been one addition to MEM that allows additional flexibility for users to verify their identity prior to performing self-service capabilities. This screen here shows the configuration component for self-service password reset. Any of you familiar with this screen will recognize that there is a QA gate near the bottom of the screen. For those that aren't familiar with the QA gate, this is where you would define the security questions a user would need to answer during registration and also the questions, the number of questions that would need to be answered and answered correctly in order to perform self-service password reset functionality. We would also define the number of questions um, in the total pool as well as the number of questions the users would have to successfully answer. MIM takes this a step further and adds some additional capabilities. Instead of only offering the security question approach to validating a user's identity, we can now leverage multi-factor authentication from Azure for this purpose. As you can see here, we've also added uh, one-time password SMS, and this option will generate a text to the user's mobile device that the user would then need to respond to in order to verify their identity. Once doing so, they'd be able to perform their, their self-service uh, activities after being authenticated. You'll also see that there's been a phone gate option added. Um, if chosen, this would initiate a phone call to the user's mobile device where they would need to respond to a challenge and once doing so would be authenticated and able to perform self-service capabilities. So here we have a couple of new alternatives to verify a user's identity before allowing them to perform self-service activities such as self-service password reset. This not only makes the process easier for the end user, but it also provides the necessary uh, security to protect corporate resources. And finally, but certainly not least, there are enhancements uh, in MIM related to certificate management. Now, while FIM included a certificate management portal, I have to be honest and state that it was rather difficult to deploy in the Hi, everyone. Sorry, we are having difficulties with sound. Steve, um, can you start again? Sure. So I'll, I'll just drop back to the beginning of this slide. Um, FIM had certificate management capabilities um, within the, the FIM portal. Uh, and honestly, those were um, a bit difficult to deploy and were fairly limited with regards to their capabilities. And now with MIM, there have been some really nice features added, along with abilities for making certificate management much more user-friendly and at the same time adding additional self-service capabilities. First of all, MIM now has the ability to manage virtual smart cards. These first appeared in Windows 8.1. And the new modern UI provides better management of the TPM initialization as well as total certificate management for virtual smart cards. Users have the ability to create, renew, and recover smart card certificates as well as other certificates. And in addition, the administrative portal for certificate management has also been updated for ease of use as well as added new performance counters as well as additional logging uh, capabilities. There is also a REST API associated with the um, virtual smart card interface to allow for creation of custom applications for users to access and leverage the self-service capabilities around certificate management uh, for an on-premise 
um, enterprise certificate authority. The only note that I will throw out here around the certificate management component is it does require that the server where the um, where MIM is residing is on enterprise or data center version. Um, so keep that in mind if you're thinking about upgrading and you're running on a standard server platform today. And finally, to wrap up, uh, I do want to mention that we, we do have a call to action uh, involving a three-day MIM upgrade readiness assessment. Uh, the assessment basically will be around uh, evaluating the existing FEM infrastructure. This is including looking at all of the FEM-related components, such as the FEM server itself, any SharePoint server or servers associated with the FEM instance for uh, self-service capabilities, as well as portal administration, uh, password reset, etc. cetera. The, uh, any SQL servers and databases associated with the FEM implementation. Uh, we will perform assessment of the sync service components, such as management agents, run profiles, et cetera, assessment of the portal configuration, as well as documentation of all findings and any recommendations, both for activities that should be performed prior to the upgrade, as well as for the upgrade process itself. This would normally be a $5,000 effort, but if customers book within 90 days, they can save an additional 25% on this three-day MIM upgrade readiness assessment. And with that, I'm going to hand over control to Peter McKenzie. Peter is a director of sales with New Signature. And Peter will take it over from here. Hopefully Thanks it's all much. yours. Yeah, that's awesome. I uh, appreciate the, uh, the call to action there and certainly something I'm going to position to a couple of my clients uh, that are using FEM. I know a lot of them are still and going to be continuing for some time to be using the hybrid infrastructure. So it sounds like MIM 2016 is going to be the best way to support that. Uh, that user self-service unlocking the uh, the password sounds pretty awesome as well. Um, from the uh, just a couple of more slides here, and then we're going to let you folks have the rest of your day to yourselves. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about new signature and, and what other services that we have. So. Uh, Steve, if you could just go to the next slide there, that would be awesome. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think we're, uh, yeah, if you could just skip right down. Perfect. Okay. Um, new signature. Uh, it's a combination of five former entities that have specialization in various areas, and I wanted to highlight what those are so you have a good idea of what besides identity management fits in. So essentially, we've broken our organization into three different pillars, and those revolve around the professional services, the managed services, and the cloud applications. So under professional services, we break down into two areas of these boxes that you can see on your screen. One is really on the platform and productivity side. So that, that, that's your traditional infrastructure technologies, the identity management that Steve was just referring to, our cloud productivity areas and our cloud platform. Uh, the other side of our professional services business focuses on the custom mobile development of applications for organizations, uh, websites and web applications, portals and intranets, primarily on the SharePoint platform, both on-prem and in the cloud, and uh, web strategy sessions that we work on with our clients in order to lay out roadmaps on where they're going. We also have a very strong managed services uh, service for our clients, and those really fall into three different offerings. 
One is uh, what we call our TMX, or Technology Management Experience, and that's really a managed services plan for 24-7 IT management through our professionals in our NOC. So think of it as your small organization. You do not have IT. You do not want to have IT, and you'd like to have help with an organization that can take that over completely for you. Um, the next managed service offering is our infrastructure management experience, and really that focuses more on the 24-7 enterprise class. So this is, you know, when you have your own servers, network, application layers. So we do the complete health and performance monitoring in hybrid scenarios. And that includes patching services, antivirus management, and OS services. Um, lastly, we have the cloud management experience. So for those of you in Azure already, in Office 365 and CRM online, we provide managed services in addition to what Microsoft provides to you. So with that, um, I wanted to let you know that you can talk to us about any of those items. We do appreciate your taking uh, the time out of your day. We would love to continue the conversations on MEM 2016 and the capabilities it provides, either by taking advantage of the uh, three-day solution that Steve outlined for you, or by your attending our next hybrid uh, webinar that hopefully you have signed up for, and if not, that webinar and all our other webinars can be uh, found out information by either going to the uh, info at newsignature.com email alias or by logging on to newsignature.com directly and looking at events and all our webinars and in-person events are listed. So with that, Thank I, you, Peter. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Steve and Peter. Now we have a few more minutes, so I'd like to open up the chat window to everyone. Um, are there any questions? Or you can go off mute and ask. Um, we have, as mentioned before, our identity and access management expert, Phil Bartholomew, on the line, and he will be answering questions for us today. Um, Thanks, Kristen. No pressure you put on me there. Yeah, none at all. <laughs> So I do actually um, have a question, Phil. The question is, should I use Azure Self-Service Password Reset or MIM Self-Service Password Reset? Uh, that's a good question. Um, great question. I've been asked that a number of times lately. Uh, as enterprises move toward the cloud, toward micro the Microsoft Cloud, that question is coming up a lot. So th there's a different answer for different clients. So let me make a few assumptions first. Uh, let me let me assume that the person asking the question, you know, you're, you're an enterprise level customer, you're in a hybrid state, so you have on-premises and you have cloud services, and probably going to remain in that state for a while. Uh, and, and so in that state, the things you have to think about here are, one, your sign-on mechanism to Azure and Office 365. So are you leveraging a federation? Are you leveraging password right back functionality with Azure AD Connect? And so that, that will come into play into the decision on whether or not you might use Azure SSPR or MEM SSPR. Um, in fact, that's probably the biggest factor. Another factor that comes into this is the fact that MEM has uh, a client extensions that integrate into the, the Windows operating system. So with MEM 2016, you can leverage the self-service password reset utilities right there through your uh, through the, the login data. Whereas with Azure SSPR, you can't do that quite yet. Um, and then um, finally, there's with MEM 2016, there is a little bit more flexibility in what you can do as far as the configuration of profiles and how you might want to set things up. So a little more flexibility there. Um, and a little bit more overall control. So that's three things to think about. There are a few more things, but those are the three key ones. So how you're handling authentication uh, with cloud services, specifically Azure and Office 365. Um, 
the client extensions that you can use with MIM 2016 for self-service, password reset, and then um, the uh, the last one that I mentioned there a minute ago. So th those are the three that uh, you want to think about, the flexibility as well. Thank you, Phil. Mm -hmm. And if you have any questions that you come up with after the webinar, um, once again, info at New Signature, we will have our identity and access management experts reach out to you directly. I want to thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone.